Good morning from Kyoto. It's 8.30 a.m. on Thursday, October 12th. My name is Aidan Berlin. I am a public interest technologist and a Landecker Democracy Fellow, and I am the moderator of today's discussion on strengthening worker autonomy in the modern workplace. I am pleased to be joined today by five esteemed panelists as we discuss the digital transformation of work and how we are redefining the relationships between employers and employees. I won't introduce each of our panelists just yet, but I'm gonna call upon our first speaker, who is Juanita Negron, the Director of Policy and Research at Coworker. And Juanita's been very instrumental in this space in providing terminology to describe a lot of what we are seeing when it comes to the evolutions in workplace surveillance and new ways of measuring productivity and other sort of forms of datafication that is happening in workplaces. Juanita, good morning, good evening for you. The question I have for you is building off of a report that Coworker published in 2021, examining the impact of technologies on workers in the US. You're now taking your research on little tech, as you term it, global. Can you maybe just give us a little background as to what little tech is, how it differs from big tech, and now that this research is being taken global, what are some of the preliminary findings that you're seeing? Yes, um, good morning to you and Kyoto as well, and uh, you're happy to kickstart this conversation. Um, as Aidan mentioned, I'm the Director of Research and Policy at Coworker, and Coworker is considered uh, to be the welcome mat to the labor movement. Um, we really, a lot of the workers we engage with, we're, because we're not a union, we're agnostic, so we get to talk to workers from every industry, everything from like the tech workers in the bigger tech companies to workers in retail, workers in manufacturing, uh, re workers in hospitality. And so through conversations with a broad set of workers across many industries, we started collecting, it was literally just a list of different apps, different vendors that different workers were sort of like coming to us about like, oh, I have to download this app now, um, like Starbucks workers to um, uh, track, you know, to sign into work. And I'm not really sure what the privacy issues were. And so we really started collecting um, different products that we were hearing from different workers across different industries. And at the time I was also in sort of the consumer privacy, big tech policy conversations. And uh, obviously those conversations were focused around sort of the five big tech companies. Um, and they were, you know, that play an outsized role in society, so not to be ignored. Um, but uh, it, was, it was five companies. Um, it was, you know, the result of like 20 years of innovation, really that these like, that we got the, the Googles and the Facebook and the Amazons Etc. And what I, what we discovered from the conversations with workers and being the consumer privacy, it was like the, that the worker, there was less attention on sort of the worker privacy surveillance and that the, the ecosystem and the marketplace and the, what workers are encountering, it's much more fragmented. It's much more expensive. It is hundreds. Uh, what became really like a short list of 10 apps and vendors became into hundreds um, and we stopped researching. It was hundreds of different apps. Um, yes, there were some, Amazon has a lot of apps that they designed. So big tech was playing a role, but there was also a lot of startups, a lot of platforms, a lot of apps. And we started, we wanted to quantify that um, by creating a database and just uh, getting a sense of what the ecosystem looks like and what we, um, when we began to, we used, we used the word little tech because it was sort of ironic that it was like little, smaller tech, um, but it was actually thousands when you could visualize the five that dominate consumer privacy conversations with the thousands that dominate worker privacy conversations and workers because they're little, sometimes they're smaller vendors, unknown like, um, unknown companies that just uh, tailor to different sectors they're not really known in workers. They don't have familiarity. So they were very confused uh, oftentimes and, and, and very concerned. I should say more confused. Just 
concerned of like, what is this new technology? Who is this vendor? Are they trustworthy? How are they using my, my information, et cetera? And so out of that, out of quantifying sort of the ecosystem that workers and coining, you know, trying to compete for airtime with the big tech world by calling it little tech, uh, we'd really developed three hypotheses um, that, that contributed to sort of expanding this to like, what is a global um, little tech of workplace technologies look like for workers across different regions. And so the three hypotheses were um, that it was, uh, obviously it was an unregulated marketplace um, of different products and vendors. And so we wanted to see if that is, if different countries have these like vast ecosystems of different workplace technologies that are being integrated um, uh, and they're touching on every part of the labor process. And that's sort of really key because um, what we learned, there was a, obviously a lot of focus on gig economy, um, but, and then bossware and surveillance, but really the, the suite of intrusive products uh, to span everything from like workplace benefits to workplace safety during COVID um, and other kind of labor optimization products like automation, um, for example, and so, um, and productivity monitoring. So we created a taxonomy and we, and hiring and recruitment. So in other words, like it's an unregulated marketplace. These technologies are touching on every part of the labor process. Um, again, from hiring and recruitment to productivity monitoring that includes surveillance to uh, workplace benefits, like it really would touch, has a lot of touch points um, in workers' lives. And then the third hypothesis that we wanted to see as we looked globally was that, um, that, that this expensiveness is collecting a lot of sensitive data points on workers. And we saw that with the little tech in the US, there is all of the, these products that are at every step of the labor process are collecting an increasing amount of really sensitive data when we, when we look at a consumer privacy space, like we know we're just starting to come to grips with just how much is being collected and workers, that ecosystem of awareness and like political education is not as strong, but workers are, we're starting to uncover just how many sensitive data points and why is very, we need to sort of focus on like the increasing amount of data points. Again, that ranged from like biometric to you know, sentiment analysis, um, to productivity monitoring, like the outputs, to like time attendance, like what we are seeing now, which is problematic, is these data points are obviously in the wave of AI. They're either being used um, to train AI models, as we've seen in call center work, and so workers, their their data is being collected in you know everything from sentiment to biometric to productivity is being collected to, to train AI models in particular sectors without their awareness. It's been collected for surveillance. There's like traditional privacy issues there. And it's being used uh, increasingly to make predictions um, not about um, which workers won't be a cultural fit, which workers um, have risk of um, everything from organizing to you know stealing sensitive data. Like a lot of employers are really worried with sort of whistleblowing that's been going on um, and data like uh, uh, industry secrets, et cetera, being um, released so that there's a lot of risk analysis um, that's happening. So there's a lot of predictive elements of like which workers are gonna go rogue, which workers are at risk. And, and so again, the collection of sensitive data points with um, the sophistication of technology to predict um, to make predictions that can affect workers uh, with a very limited recourse um, has been problematic. So those are three things that we went out to, to see. And we focused on um, our global research, just to wrap up, is, was in Nigeria, Kenya, Colombia, and Brazil. Um, and those, we zeroed in on those countries because they, um, we were looking at sort of, a, you know, this next wave of innovate, tech innovation that was like unleashed because of COVID. So these particular countries had received um, a large share of sort of venture capital money uh, for tech innovation in the past four or five years. And so we sort of at the like countries at the global level, they were in the top 10. 
And so we wanted to see like, what is the innovation space look like? What are the types of technologies that are coming out? And what we're seeing is um, we are seeing the un, that the ecosystem of products in the marketplace um, are mostly still dominated by gig economy, but there is an increasing amount of products and companies not necessarily um, in those particular countries, but sometimes it's uh, you know global north countries selling to global uh, majority employers and that are being used, uh, being sold to workers and sort of as kind of traditional business um, to, to fulfill business outcomes to like process payroll, to everything for processing payroll to um, you know timekeeping and some low tech things, but the the data again, um, it's not only the business function that we're looking at, but it's also the types of data that are being collected. Um, those have been sort of the same patterns that we saw in the U.S. Just a lot of uh, and in these global majority countries, there is also no uh, data or consumer privacy laws. So. For workers, again, the awareness of what to do is is uh, a lot more limited. I don't know if you if I just stop there just to give folks uh, other folks a chance to weigh in. Thank you so much, Juanita, for that excellent introduction. I'm going to bring Eliza into the conversation now, because Eliza, you've just published an excellent report, digitally divided, and some of the comments that Juanita was just making about what you term ghost work. Uh, really hit 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 out at me. So perhaps, Eliza, you could comment on why Amnesty International has long been researching the intersection of technology and global inequality, but it is a bit newer of you to be investigating the intersection of labor rights and technology. What changed? What sparked the need for your digitally divided report? And the case study that you introduced in the report on ghost work, maybe you can briefly summarize that for everyone in the room today. Sure, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Volneda for that really great kind of introduction. I can't um, follow that with uh, quite the same debt level of specificity because the report um, covers a much more kind of broad set of issues at the intersection of inequality. And I guess to kind of like back out and start from like a more high level approach, I will just say, and again, I'm representing my views here and not those of amnesty because a lot of our views on these tech issues are still kind of in flux. Um, the human rights community doesn't really have a strong history when it comes to talking about issues of economic inequality writ large. And that includes issues of labor exploitation, which is a bit of a problem because it is the case and it's been the case for quite some time, even prior to kind of the advent of the digital era and like the rollout of um, sort of these more app-based or um, database technologies that Wilnita was describing, that the concept of like the sweatshop, right? Like the idea of workers in the global majority or in a country where labor laws are much more lax, doing and creating a lot of the value for companies that are based in the global North has always existed. And what I try to show in this report and the case that I try to make is that the digital advent of this um, sort of digital sweatshop, I guess, is that's a term others have used, um, is basically the same practice. It's just applied to a different case. And I think what's useful um, as another kind of note and point of reference as to why this work is coming out of Amnesty right now. Um, so my work is part of a, a fellowship that's specifically focused on the intersection of technology and inequality. And I think it does come out of this issue within the human rights community more broadly, and I think within sort of like policy circles um, in general, in talking about this issue of like, you see this buzzword everywhere now, inequality and all these grant making schemes and in different kind of like human development reports. And I, I do take issue with that term a little bit because I think it kind of anonymizes the, the issue and sort of makes it out to be this kind of like mystery dropped out of nowhere. But poverty doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of like explicit and deliberate labor practices and explicit and deliberate economic tax practices. Amnesty also has some really interesting new work coming out right now about tax policy and about how the lax or um, ineffectively enforced tax policies of countries around the world have made it possible for austerity measures with cuts to social programs directly leading to enormous human rights abuses. And so this is all part of a larger kind of ecosystem and that's what we try to show in the report is that all of this is coming in the context of two issues that I think I think Wilnita really nicely kind of like laid out for me that I also think are essential kind of context, which is 
One, that this is happening in the context of an unprecedented um, status for global inequality, wealth inequality around the world. I think the latest number I've seen is that the world's poorest own just 2% of global wealth and the world's richest own 75% of wealth, which is a staggering inequality that's really hard to fathom. And what's even more hard to believe is that over the four years since um, the outbreak of the pandemic, this has really, really accelerated. And that's happened in tandem with the rollout of different kinds of reliance, different kinds of uh, government, public sector applications of technologies that Wilnada alluded to. And so what we lay out in the report is three areas of concern for policymakers that are trying to understand the impact um, of technology and inequality kind of in a very broad way, because there's, there's just so much to cover within that. So we try to narrow it down to a couple of kind of core populations of concern. And one of them is labor. And I think we'll continue to talk about this and I'll continue to say why I think that that's a core area that I laid out. And the other two are migration and borders. Um, so the movement of people and the right to asylum. And then the last one is, is criminal justice and policing. And I think the last thing I'll say before I finish, because this is a long answer to your question, is that um, part of the reason, and it's interesting that this work is coming at this moment, um, Amnesty Tech specifically has pre-existing work that focuses primarily on issues of surveillance, um, where we mean like spyware, different kinds of predictive policing, um, and then different issues around uh, digitization and automated decision making in the public sector. So in some ways that already kind of like sets up the framework to talk about labor, because when you think about criminal justice and predictive policing, labor and migration, it's easy if you look closely to see how these things are related and how data sharing between employers, between schools, between you know, local law enforcement agencies is going to be increasingly a practice, particularly for populations for whom there are few or you know, less enforced legal protections, especially for more vulnerable people. Um, and so what I show, and this is just my last point, is that I think technology in some ways has become kind of like an accelerator and a facilitator of inequality, or it's become kind of like the helpful cover story for why we let inequality persist and become exacerbated. So that's a very long answer, but hopefully that's an introduction to the report, and I'm really happy to go into more detail and, and talk more about that. Thank you so much, Eliza. And I would love to go into a little more detail in the second half of our session, but for now, I'm gonna bring in Eduardo Carrillo, who is the co-director of the Paraguay nonprofit TEDIC. And Eduardo, maybe I can ask what your reaction is to what Eliza and Juanita have just said. And also, I mean, I, I, mean I, I find the comment that you said, Eliza, that really struck me just then was, Poverty doesn't come out, come out of nowhere. It comes out of deliberate uh, uh, policy interventions. What do you think about that, Eduardo? And you have been doing research on the impact of algorithmic management on low paid workers in Paraguay. Do you agree with Eliza's statement? And in the context of the low paid workers in Paraguay that you have been researching in the transport and delivery space. How does that ring true? This is working, yes. Well, thank you so much, Aiden, uh, and great to connect with Eliza and with, with Neda. Um, I think definitely poverty doesn't come out of nowhere. We are in an inequality system that is now Further, further perpetuated by the implementation of digital technologies. So I'm glad that there's this connection happening because I sort of like digress a bit my presentation to talk about the, the context in Paraguay and the broader surveillance situation that workers traditionally already suffer. And, and it's important to recognize that it's not that technology creates uh, a new surveillance and that before time workers weren't surveilled. This is a situation in which that already existing surveillance is being augmented and improved by digital systems. Uh, so it's important to also situate ourselves historically and, 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 and recognize that this is not happening out of the blue. It's just a way in which our current capitalist system is reinventing itself to continue exploiting uh, workers and extracting as much uh, surplus as possible. So, um, Sorry for that. <laughs> um, 
For those who don't know me, thank you so much for the presentation, Aiden. My name is Eduardo and I am co-director of TEDIC. We're a digital rights organization based uh, in Paraguay. Uh, so as part of our broader efforts for a more just digital economy that includes workers' rights, uh, we partnered last year with the Fair Work Project. Fair Work is an international action research project that evaluates working conditions in the platform economy in more than 30 countries. So for us, it's very important to generate uh, as much data as possible in order to have a comparison of the different platforms that we rate across the globe and that most of the time repeat themselves uh, in different contexts and in different countries. And I'm gonna come back to that because there's an element of transnationality that I think uh, is useful to, to reflect upon in this, particular panel, in this particular panel. So in this project, we score the platforms against five principles for those who don't know the, 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 the research and the methodology. Uh, fair pay, fair conditions, fair contract, fair management, and fair representation. Now, going a bit into the beginning of what I was saying, uh, before going into the core of my presentation and why we focused on transportation and delivery apps within the gig economy, I think it is important to highlight that in Paraguay there have been traditional ways in which workers are surveilled in the workplace that are not per se technology dependent, but reflect a complicated reality for workers. Uh, for example, we researched a few years ago how companies, uh, when they hire workers, they ask for more health data than what is required by law. We're talking, for instance, about HIV status. So year by year, we hear how um, workers have been fired because their employers have unlawfully access to HIV status information. Um, and, and what I want to say here more than anything is that workers' rights to privacy and data protection have been historically violated and this acquires a new dimension in the digital economy, particularly the gig economy. Um, this is why for the past years we have seen an exponential growth of the platform economy in Paraguay and it is why we partner with the Fair Work Net Network to evaluate six ride hailing and delivery platforms operating in Paraguay. Some of the platforms that we evaluated are probably familiar to you all. We are talking about the Ubers and the Volt of the world. Pedidos Ya, which is a transnational uh, delivery transport app that is uh, very uh, dominant in Latin America. And in general, and I don't want to lose that much time in talking about the findings, but only two of the six studied platforms could score any points in, in, in the principles that in total scored 10 points. So the platform that had the most amount of, of scoring was only two out of 10. So it is safe to affirm in general that gig economy workers uh, have little to no possibility of meaningfully engaging with these platforms whenever they feel mistreated, nor they have true capacity to scrutinize the algorithms that surveil and govern their everyday lives. Um, and this is what is reflected in, in the overall scorings that we were able to, to, to gather, let's say. Um, and, and perhaps connecting these reflections with the broader topic of the panel, I think it is important to point out also that, and, and I'm going now to the issue of the transnationality. So in my perspective, um, these platforms are transnational by nature. So this trans transnationality poses or poses an important data sovereignty aspect that we should also reflect upon when we're thinking about workers' rights in its different nuances and its intersection with data protection specifically. So we're currently in a highly digital extractive scenario whereby Global South workers are providing vast amount of data for sen of sensitive NATO nature, for instance, biometric data, that is then used to train these algorithms uh, of these platforms for that in a not so far future, uh, they can create technology that will make the platform less dependent on on, on, on workers' services, quote unquote, in general. So it's a, it's a circle that never, never ends, this one is of, uh, of the exploitation, how exploitation can reinvent itself. Um, and I think that I would like to leave perhaps as a final reflection that uh, in Latin America in general, I mean, I'm based in Paraguay, but we also try to see it in a regional lens, uh, this situation. When we think about workplace surveillance that is augmented or improved by digital systems, it is important to remember that such surveillance itself insert itself in an already highly precarious work environments where workers normally are excluded from reparation mechanisms in general. 
And in this scenario, introducing digital interfaces that either intermediate work or surveil the workforce, they tend to go unnoticed until they become difficult to roll back. And more importantly, and specifically in relation to the gig economy uh, in global south countries, uh, there is a normalization of work precarity in contexts where there is a lack of economic opportunities in general. So there is a sort of like take it or leave it work philosophy that is installed that has evident counterproductive efforts to the full enjoyment of uh, workers' rights. And lastly, um, or I have to, I don't know if I'm past my time, but just two final reflections. We also have a complicated scenario that is cut through by the historic uh, regulatory depths in our country. So Paraguay doesn't have a personal data protection law. We don't have a law against all forms of discrimination. So that lack of regulatory uh, certainty for traditional uh, rights, uh, when intersecting with digital technologies and intersecting with workers' rights, they pose uh, an additional situation that tends to expand structural injustices for workers. So I think that you know the 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 future, or if we are going to aim to try to build a fair digital future, will only happen through workers' collective organization. So we need to fight for a true free surveillance environment uh, workplace for workers to truly exercise their right to freedom of expression, association, and autonomy, and, 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 and collectively organize. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eduardo. Can I ask a super quick follow-up question just to the very last point that you made about, really, which gets to the heart of what this discussion is about, which is about resistance and pushing back. What can workers actually do in Paraguay? Are there tactics that workers have been able to use on these? No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Are there are there platform? Are there losing my train of thought now? Um, what can workers do? Yeah, yeah. That, that was a general question. Yeah, resistance. <laughs> uh, how, what does that look like in the Paraguayan context? Well, it's a complicated reality. I'm, I'm, I know I'm using a lot that <laughs> that catchphrase, um, but the thing is that Paraguay, curiously or not so curiously, is one of uh, the countries with the lowest unionization rate of Latin America. So that's already a lot uh, in a context of, of precarity in general. The private sector workforce has less percent, has less than 1% of, of, of an unionization rate. So traditional ways in which workers could organize, which is indeed um, being perhaps in a union, is not something that is very traditional in the country. And I think that there needs to be a shift in that understanding from workers, but it's a diffi difficult cultural uh, shift that is also associated with uh, a lot of uncertainty because most of the time workers, whenever they do try to organize in the country, they tend to be fired before they form the union. Uh, so we don't have data that this is happening currently in the actual gig economy environment, but it is definitely a cultural perception of people and workers in general. And I think this is the first step that we need to try to overcome uh, for starting to generate these organized spaces that also understand digital technologies and the complexities in the intersection with workers' rights. Sure. Thank you, Eduardo. And Rashi. Rashi Sagzana is a social innovation practitioner based in India. And the situation that Eduardo has just described in Paraguay, does it sound familiar? Uh, I mean, I, I imagine the answer is yes, that gig economy platforms are being rolled out in India, treating workers similarly. Resistance is futile. Um, you're probably an independent contractor versus a worker. What, what do you say, to, what, do you, what does the situation look like on the ground for you? I do feel like there are a lot of, um, we've historically had a lot of short-term contracts, uh, quote-unquote gig economy platforms. Uh, we have a very large informal sector, and since we uh, define it or call it an informal sector, it's, it's usually dubbed as not contributing to the economy. Uh, but yes, there have been uh, various instances of uh, workers and policymakers that are pushing back against uh, this exploitation. Um, and a lot of this exploitation has also been exacerbated in India with the emergence of a lot of uh, tech-based apps. Uh, it could be cab aggregators like Uber or um, a local uh, Ola, um, Zomato, Swiggy, um, uh, which are more of food companies, urban companies to kind of 
work on any conceit services. Um, they offer a wide range of services uh, as, you know, ordering a food, e-commerce, home services and more. And a lot of concerns have been coming on the working conditions of these gig economy workers, uh, right from uh, issues of a low pay, especially with the kickback in the VC ecosystem, um, job security, um, ridiculous uh, long working hours, and of course the lack of general social protections um, such as healthcare or general uh, pen pension benefits. And in response to that, there are a lot of, there has been um, a lot of gig economy workers that have banded together and formed unions for better working conditions. A lot of them amongst themselves have also banded together and some of them are very inspiring to me personally. Um, in Mumbai, we have, uh, we have local taxis and we call them Kali Pili taxis. Um, yellow black taxis that have banded together and formed their own local app that has slightly better wages. Uh, back in Bangalore where I reside, um, we have, um, uh, we have an application more of, I would say again, local or, you know, local transport folks coming in together and it's called Nama Metro, which offers uh, fair pay and also, of course, uh, is more reliable, surprisingly, amongst us uh, who are um, avid users. Um, and in 2020, uh, the Indian Federation um, App Transport Workers organized a nationwide strike to uh, have better uh, pay conditions uh, for uh, a lot of these ride-hailing platforms. Um, recently, there was also um, the a local government in India, the Rajasthan government also uh, came out with the legislation where a lot of gig workers should be given a basic pension and social scheme benefits. Um, and yes, they have been, uh, take, there have been significant steps, I would say, by the Indian government where they introduced a labor code that aims to provide social security benefits to gay economy workers. Uh, but again, a lot of it is uh, an implementation issue in my country. There might be a lot of things that are written, well-defined on paper, uh, but implementation-wise, um, I would still say there have been a lot of instances and opportunities where um, things have been exploited and most uh, employers uh, do uh, the bare minimum when it comes to um, addressing these issues. And of course, uh, leading to uh, them being treated unfairly. And we've seen several instances, um, even during COVID, where most of the factory factories were shut down, but there was no um, direct support to many industries I hope that helps. Absolutely, thank you, Rashi. And I'm gonna bring Eliza back into the conversation because I said before we were gonna dive into your report and you introduced three different case studies in the report, which are different examples than the ones that Eduardo and Rashi have highlighted. But one of them was when you, you spoke about the availability of generative AI tools, most of which are relying upon hidden human labor, trained on the labor and data of people around the world. These are points that Wilnaida also raised earlier today. And how these poses risks to labor security and workers' rights in the gig economy, and that it seems likely that this is only going to grow in scope and significance in the future. And I'm curious what you think is the future over the next five to 10 years, or even further, how do you see workplace surveillance technologies evolving, particularly with advancements in AI and other emerging technologies? Uh, is it as dystopian to you as it feels to me? Yeah, I think we're probably being kept up at night by the same vision of the next five to 10 years, if I'm honest. But um, yeah, I think to speak to that very good question and some of the points that have been raised, um, I saw this point that I keep thinking about by this venture, uh, this London-based venture capital firm, I think it's MMM Ventures, that surveyed about 2,800 um, AI startups in the EU that are purporting themselves to be AI-first companies, and found that more than 40% of them actually weren't using AI in any meaningful way. It was just sort of like a branding exercise. And so I kind of think about that as like the touch point for how I think of where I see kind of the next phase um, of how this is gonna be rolled out and how this is going to impact um, people across the global economy. I think basically 
what we're seeing right now. And even though, you know, the there are remarkable, you know, advances to some of these um, uh, generative AI, or yeah, I don't necessarily agree with calling it that, but <laughs> with some of the newer versions of automation for image or text generation. But it is the case that we have a remarkable lack of clarity about exactly how and in what ways um, those tools are developed with what models. Um, we know with some certainty that a lot of the models that these tools are being trained on are either committing plagiarism at a huge rate or they're being trained on data sets that don't you know, take into consideration the vast amounts of inaccurate data, the vast amounts of hate speech that they might be absorbing. Um, and it's also the case that a lot of workplaces and a lot of companies now are going to be under pressure kind of as AI becomes like, you know, basically, like I said, a, a very trendy marketing ploy by which a lot of companies kind of have to assert themselves as being relevant in the market. There's going to be, I think, a race to the bottom in terms of how uh, the marketing kind of outpaces the tools themselves. And at the same time, a lot of these companies are actually being forced to rely upon what others have termed ghost work um, or sort of, uh, yeah, the digital sweatshop that I mentioned earlier. A lot of the times, I mean, there have been cases shown um, in Finland, there's a, a company that's gotten a, a significant round of venture capital funding to create a model using um, incarcerated people in Finland to help basically do image labeling and to do the kind of um, sort of digital piecework that makes that tool possible. There have been cases of humanitarian instances or companies that sort of purport themselves to be um, assisting or helping refugees or asylum seekers that are using those populations, again, who are in a very precarious situation and don't have a lot of choices for work, using them as image labelers or sort of doing the digital piecework that's required to make these tools possible. And so my fear is that we're going to see like an increasingly bottomless need for not just for data, but for the capacity to basically do what AI purports to do, which does require, at least as of now, a tremendous amount of actual human labor, but that most companies sort of want to keep hidden. And so that's sort of something I think about as we think about the future and where policymakers should be putting their attention is looking carefully to see where there are going to be populations of very precarious people who have very little, um, who are desperate, who have very little option for how they're going to make their living, and to look where and in what ways they might be kind of fed into the global like supply chain of a lot of these companies and a lot of these technologies. And I think that's something I will watch with a little bit of uh, fear, but uh, like I'll watch closely. Thank you. And can I ask a really basic follow-up question, which is, why do companies want to keep that labor hidden? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's embarrassing to them. They don't want to have to admit that the tool that they developed isn't as advanced as they purport it to be. We saw this first, um, or one of the most, the first cases that I saw that was sort of the most impactful was um, Meta. And we still don't know, again, because a lot of these tools and a lot of the evidence about them is kept very non-transparent. But we have it on pretty decent authority that a lot of the content moderation tools that Meta purported to be AI-based were actually just humans in the loop, basically. And so when I think about the motivation for a company like that, in that particular instance, I think it makes people feel safe and better about the tool that they're using. And people naturally kind of have a bias towards like respecting something if it's tech powered, frankly. And so I think that may be part of it. And I also think, again, it's just people don't want to have to consider the human power, the human labor that goes into the goods that we consume, whether it's generative AI or it's like the clothes that we make. We just it's easier not to think about where they came from, how they were made. Thank you. Um, Juanita, we have an opportunity here at the IGF to provide some call to actions to policymakers and to put some call to actions in the key messages coming out of the IGF. What, what thoughts come to your mind given the increasing prevalence of workplace surveillance, the trends that you have seen, the trajectory that Eliza has outlined, what steps or strategies would you recommend that policymakers take to mitigate the impacts of this change in work that is happening around us? Yeah, um, I think 
uh, just from the conversations in the U.S. and what we've been seeing in, in other regions, it's, um, it's really going to require a mix of policy and regulatory action. And some of the policy work is going to be need to be focused on establishing some basic protections for workers. A lot of the legislation coming out of the U.S. Um, is really focused at the national and at the state levels, focused on just disclosure, like requiring employers to um, disclose in a timely manner um, that they are using these technologies. Um, that is from GDPR, we have known that, you know, the consent model is problematic. Um, and when dealing with not one, not, you know, a small collection of big kind of tech companies to talk about a lot, of the being able to consent and for workers to sort of disclose different products that they're interacting with is, is highly problematic. So we know that workers need a basic level of protection that goes beyond, um, you know, consenting and disclosure requirements. Um, we are seeing, because it's fragmented, the policy solutions are really fragmented right now. We're seeing a lot around uh, focusing on algorithm, like the ways of trying to regulate her algorithmic um, tools are being used, either for her, uh, hiring and recruitment, um, requiring uh, vendors to undergo particular audits and impact assessments. And there's a whole ecosystem of just like who audits the auditors that are now being um, required by some agency to sort of regulate some of these companies. And so I think that, you know, these are all worthwhile conversations, like looking at the particular kinds of really invasive uses um, that are algorithmic driven or that collect sense, highly sensitive data like biometric data. So like zeroing in a particularly sensitive types of data, really sensitive types of uses and maybe going to GDPR model where you um, you focus on sort of like risk and regulate by risk and use cases. But again, not forgetting that workers need um, a basic level of protection. Um, we have in the US, unfortunately, a consumer privacy law, so it's hard right now to make us uh, for to encroach on private uh, actors, employers in this case and require them. Um, so there's a whole lot happening on the sort of self-regulation because in the US and this goes to, um, you know, the di economic dynamics that Eliza's talking about. Um, we are in, we work in an economic, economic system where there, the state is still does not feel like it can intrude in the private uh, matters of business in the private sector. And so you're seeing a lot as policy and regulatory try to figure out um, what particular aspects of these technologies um, can be regulated or you can provide protections for or require employers to sort of do some due diligence on. Um, there, there's not much intrusion into the economic private matters of companies in terms of requiring them to provide protections to workers. Um, and so that goes into sort of the reality of the market, uh, the economy. And that goes into sort of the, the last set of kind of solutions is like you have to address, it's where a lot of, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time as well, not only just organizing workers, but on the market dynamics, you know, the drivers of these trends, we cannot continue to, you know, fight um, after the fact of just the fact that technology, like, Hundreds of products um, are coming out every year, um, and in, there's still no legislation, as I mentioned. And so, how can we tackle um, the market dynamics that have create that inequality in the U.S.? That looks like you know, looking at anti-monopoly. It looks like mergers and acquisitions, which is, happens a lot in the data, data uh, brokerage industry in the U.S. We're seeing a lot of like these smaller data brokers collecting this sensitive employment data and sort of they're being they're being acquired by bigger data brokers and so can we use the power of um mergers and acquisitions um to kind of you know uh like a better word just try to like tone down that market dynamic um another thing would be looking at um you know the private capital space the venture capital um requiring greater disclosures requiring um right now they're very, there's very little accountability of sort of the private markets. Uh, the private markets are where these companies, it's where the Facebooks of the world um, go before they IPO 
and hit the public markets. And so it's really critical to try to um, intervene at those early stages when these future Facebooks of the world are in the private market space. And there is a lot happening there, everything from ESG to other kinds of disclosures of, of how, what types of companies are being invested in. And so, yeah, a lot of market kind of industry focused dynamics of like, how can we, we cannot continue to fight this battle with these market, like existing market conditions that drive this kind of innovation in these products. And um, as a state sort of struggles to intervene, um, in addition, to, again, to like all the policy and like multi-agency work um, that's needed to like regulate particular harmful technologies and provide some kind of protection for workers beyond, you know, just disclosure and consent. So there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> and to, to what extent that there are spaces to what Eduardo was saying for us to uh, strategize on, you know, national, regional level, I think is really, it's, it's really very much needed, so. Thank you so much, Juanita. And Eduardo, I'd love for you to react to Juanita's comments just the, around, do we need to tone down that market dynamic? Do we need greater disclosure when it comes to venture capital? And also, if I can throw in an extra point that I have heard others raise, which is around the argument that the value of worker data is arguably in its collective use by both workers and employers. And if we were to think about what that would look like if workers and or their representatives who advocate for their legitimate interests were to have collective rights to worker data. And I don't mean health data, for example. I, I mean different forms of data, whether that is around um, injury rates, other, other metrics. What might those rights look like? Would that be helpful? Uh, what do you think? What else should we be asking for? I think that uh, I'll start from the last question and then connect with some of, some of the points that uh, Juanita and Elizabeth uh, made that I think were uh, quite interesting. I think that my worry in uh, sort of like posing those very complex ways of governing uh, a shared access of data in a public interest way, in, in benefit of workers, I mean, uh, I feel that it's a bit difficult in, in Global South context where people are still learning how this ecosystem even works. So sometimes I feel that if that is going to be the whitewashing that some companies could potentially do, uh, it could be dangerous um, and without any true meaning. Um, so I feel that at this point we need to go back to the basics of what workers' rights uh, fight us fight is, at least in Global South context, that means uh, to fight for companies to truly allow workers organization and in the context of gig economy platforms that they actually recognize that they are workers. Um, in order for those other complex discussions can come to be. Um, right now, in Latin America in general, none of the platforms recognize the workers' uh, dependency and more, most of the regulation at the moment uh, because there are regulatory efforts from governments that are trying to understand how the gig economy works, are posing, are, start, are starting to pose this question, are they dependent workers or not, and what kind of models or hybrid models could coexist in terms of dependent and not dependent workers that are interesting and that could potentially pave the way for uh, more safeguards for these uh, workers. And perhaps connecting with some of the things that uh, Eliza and Wilneda were saying, I really, I think that another tool that perhaps we don't think a lot is uh, how competition can perhaps help us in also better improve the current digital economy as it exists, that is currently, as we know, very concentrated. And competition in its intersection with data protection and privacy is pretty much a novelty also at the moment. And I think that we should fight for competition to also uh, help in the fight of creating better working conditions and understand that if there are perhaps very unequal ways of treating workers and in which, or, or very, let's say, predatory ways in which data is exploited and so on, 
that can also be considered uh, a competitive parameter. I know there's a lot of uh, resistance in trying to expand how competition currently works, but I think that there's a, it's a conversation worth having because we need to use as much elements as we have to improve the current digital economy ecosystem and a lot of the problems that we have right now is that it is highly concentrated. Um, and that then of course has an impact in the way data protection is enforced, uh, in how people interact with platforms and so on. Um, and then, the, and, and then I, I, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the, the issue of the, the, the ghost sweatshops uh, was mentioned by Eliza. And I think that one of the other reasons of why platforms perhaps don't recognize that is that if you don't recognize the problem, then it's not, it's not a problem, right? So you d won't address those issues and you won't address the current inequality and the current exploitation that these workers are currently facing because you just don't acknowledge that that is a problem uh, in its own. And that is also connected with a lot of interest from governments that they want these companies to install those threat shops in their countries in order to, 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 to create jobs that, although precarious, are also jobs in a context of a lot of inequality. So I think that, lastly, also in terms of the future, that, that was sort of like a question that you, 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 you asked me at the, the beginning. I think that a lot of the future and what other things workers could also do is uh, related to platform corporate cooperativism. I think that's an interesting concept that is starting to become more present in different discussions of workers who are trying to build their own digital infrastructure and have more autonomy in the ways uh, they will design uh, the, the platforms that they will work on. But I think that, that th those discussions have to be highly supported by national governments that should invest in those kinds of programs and allow this kind of exploration to happen in order to, to, to build other sorts of business models that are more cooperative and just in their roots. Um, so yeah, thank you. Eduardo, thank you. And Rashi, Saxena, I'll bring you back into the conversation, of course you have the opportunity to respond to Eduardo's comments as well as the comments from Eliza and Monida. I'll also give you your own question to answer, which is that we are in UN fora. You have been following the WISIS plus 20 renewal process and the Global Digital Compact and how it can potentially contribute to bridging the gender digital divide and promoting the empowerment of women and girls in the digital sphere. Is there a labor connection here? Are these instruments which can potentially help uplift workers and particularly female workers? Um, no, there, there definitely is. Um, and I feel like a lot of my responses will also contribute to a lot of the aspects that will need are brought out with the VC ecosystem and how fractured it is when it comes to uh, contributing or providing uh, support, I think globally, only 7% of female founders are actually backed up by VCs. And especially in the Indian ecosystem, it's more of you need to be from an ABC uh, ecosystem to be able to capture that funding. Um, so I feel like it's very insular in many ways. Um, also, to bring down to uh, Eli Eliza's point, um, I have seen that in especially with the labor practices of a lot of content moderators, um, are usually in general uh, very hidden, and in in the VC in in the VC uh, ecosystem, I've also seen that maybe the PR aspect of promoting something uh, as AI would gather or harness more money. So it's more of a PR exercise than actually, um, and and also kind of propagating that AI is this magic wand that will magically wish wash away a lot of the, you know, aspects uh, of inequality. Uh, but um, talking about the WISIS uh, 20 renewal process and the Global Digital Compact, um, I do feel like it has the potential to significantly bring in the gender uh, digital divide, one with helping identifying uh, the barriers that prevent women from accessing digital technologies in India, most of the local households have, um, or the devices shared among uh, an entire family. Um, so having agency uh, towards um, having your own device 
could help in improving digital literacy skills. Um, also, uh, kind of uh, crossing and cutting the social and cultural barriers that women have when it comes to mobility. Um, and it could also, um, India also has a very cheap uh, internet tariff rates, so having access to these devices and, in, and internet could also help in promoting uh, locally re relevant uh, content and services um, and also employment. And one aspect that also gets missed out is that uh, a lot of people with different disabilities, um, especially women, are more disproportionately impacted and have more social stigma. So having um, Having proper access uh, would also help them to participate uh, in a social setting, in a cultural setting, and also uh, give them a dignified livelihood. Um, the other one uh, with the Global uh, Digital Compact uh, could also assure that women have access to equal opportunities in the digital revolution, whether it's uh, an initiative that they want to promote uh, on, a, on a small scale or a medium scale uh, to also uh, support uh, women in the startup ecosystem um, and help uh, general representation uh, in digital leadership roles. Uh, and one of the very important ones uh, is also uh, the um, addressing the online uh, violence and harassment. Uh, the growing phenomena that you have, um, especially with generative AI, doctor videos, uh, synthetic videos, uh, which for the longest time used to uh, affect women uh, in public life, but a lot of women, um, such as myself and Will and so many others, uh, could be perpetrators of this. And I do feel like having robust policies uh, around this could help develop um, responses uh, on how to combat this, uh, promote digital safety and security, uh, collaborating with TDIC perhaps, uh, to ensure that victims have access uh, to effective uh, support and redressal mechanisms. Um, and lastly, of course, uh, the Global Digital Compact and VISIS process could also encourage governments and other stakeholders, given that we're at the IGF, uh, to take specific needs and priorities uh, for women in the digital sphere to, um, of course, increase participation uh, in the decision-making processes and help uh, in the development, implementation, uh, and initiation of policies and programs. Thank you so much, Rashi. We are nearing the top of the hour, but before we close, I would like to give each speaker just 30 seconds for very brief closing remarks on how we can collectively develop strategies that ensure fair and equitable workplace practices in this new era, and I know 30 seconds is not enough to actually answer that question, but we'll need to, please. Uh, thinking about building cross-class um, power with workers across regions, cross-class, cross-industries. Um, there is a lot of connective tissue there. There's a lot of shared analysis um, that could be connected. And and I, I think that is, you know, there's an opportunity there that we're not tapping into. Thank you. Eliza? Yeah, I guess I'll just say kind of as a final wrap up that I think um, our community of people who work on digital rights and tech policy, I think we need to do a lot more to expand the way that we think um, across different sectors of the policy community and to work with people who are working in unionization, people who are working in climate change. There are increasing numbers of climate issues in, in the application of AI that we didn't even get into. And just thinking about our sector kind of as part of the global um, set of issues that are creating and exacerbating wealth inequality, racial inequality, um, and yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you, Eliza. Eduardo? Yes. I would say definitely um, in the context of the gig economy at least, we need more regulation uh, that is collectively built with the voices of workers, not necessarily from a top-down approach, and also, uh, but not least, more ownership of the infrastructure uh, from workers is something that is also important and that should be of the digital infrastructure and it's something that should be uh, in the discussions as well. And you get the last word, Rashi. Hi. Yeah, and I think there needs to be more conversations around these. There's a lot of uh, cultural stigma on speaking up. Uh, we need to stop uh, being in silos, uh, acting up, having more conversations, information. 
uh, around how uh, we could effectively band up together uh, in places like this and hold companies accountable. Thank you, everyone. It has been a pleasure being in company with you today. I hope we can continue this discussion intersessionally and also at next year's Internet Governance Forum in Riyadh. And for now, we can adjourn this session at 9.30 a.m. Thank you.